today I actually want to talk to you about drawing. Specifically, I want to frame drawing as simply speaking with images. And I want to try to explain why drawing allows us to communicate with one another and share and modify our ideas in ways that speaking and writing can't. I also want to try to convince you that drawing is most powerful as an action, not as an end product. So regardless of your drawing skill or how long it's been since you might have drawn something, simply engaging in the act of drawing with others can be an incredibly powerful collaborative tool. Now, while many of us may not be very comfortable with drawing, we're probably pretty good at imagining. So let's start there. I want you to try to think of your favorite place. What kinds of images come to mind? Just then, as you were trying to imagine your favorite place, you were activating the same parts of your brain associated with visual processing that are activated when you were really in that space. Now, this is pretty cool, but it also introduces a problem because our imaginings have to compete with the incoming visual information from the world around us to use those same parts of the brain. And because of the sheer amount of visual stimuli in the outside world, it can easily overwhelm our imaginings and we get distracted. One more exercise. I want you to think of a cube, and I want you to cut that cube in half. I want you to cut all of those pieces in half, and I want you to cut all of those pieces in half again. How many pieces do you have? How many of you, <laughs> How many of you imagine something that looked like this? Or like this, or this, maybe one of these? And more importantly, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Now, this exercise points out two things. One, that we can only keep track of so many things in our minds at once. And two, that with the same starting point and the same instructions, each one of you can end up in an entirely different place. So in light of these mental limitations or obstacles, it makes sense that taking our ideas and using drawing, we put them out into the real world, allows them to become part of our incoming visual stream and our brains can make new meaning from them. And that cycle feeds itself. So instead of talking to you today about how to develop your artistic drawing skill, I want to share just a few concepts that help place drawing as the connection between the way that we uh, experience visual information and the way that we tend to communicate with one another. The first of those concepts balances the uh, time invested in our drawings and the thoroughness of our drawings. From Pictionary to board meetings, we all know that time is of the essence. And rarely do we have enough time to wait for a complete visualization of an idea or a system before we have to make some kind of action or decision on that information. Now, how is it possible that we can view incomplete information and still understand it? Our brains do this all the time. What do you see in this image? You got it right, great job. And in this image, even if I just tell you that these are just dots, your brains have probably already turned them into lines. In this last image, how many of you saw these three shapes? Probably just these two, right? Because it makes the most sense to us. Now, these images help highlight that our brains seek out the most likely explanation for what we're seeing based on the information that is available. And when that information is not available or is unclear, our brains fill in the rest of the story. So if we know that our brains are doing this already, then in terms of drawing, we can keep this in mind. Done is better than perfect. Because when it's done, then we can make it perfect. So our next concept, drawing the known versus the seen, deals more directly with the nature of perfection in our drawings. For this, I want you to think back on the way you drew as a child. From scribbles, to shapes, to faces. For a few years, you drew all kinds of stuff. Until around the age of 10, when you had a growing awareness that the things that you were drawing maybe didn't look the way that you intended. Right? This drawing, while packed with information, may or may not be a perfect representation of a fishbowl. So at that same time, <laughs> at that same time, that growing awareness, coupled with an expanding vocabulary, means that in short order, you replace drawing with speaking and writing as your primary forms of communication. Chances are good, we probably never look back. So then some years later, when we go to draw again, uh, it could be a little embarrassing because it may look like a child's drawing. But the important thing to remember is that at that point in your life, you were using drawing as a way of communicating what you knew about the world around you, and you weren't preoccupied with how it looked. For a more pragmatic application of this concept, we'll look at a classic example. 
Long before Henry Beck ever took a stab at it, the London tube map was simply a geographical map with the underground lines overlaid on top of it. Over the years, the addition of color helped to stratify some of that information, but it was still only an incremental improvement. Beck realized that in this case, informational clarity was more important than geographical truth. And his redesign, which we're all pretty familiar with, placed priority on the information that a traveler needed to know, like how many stops until my stop, or where should I transfer? So what can mapping tell us about drawing? Well, we never really map reality. We map how we see reality, which is very different. And these are encouraging words for us if we're gonna draw with each other because it means we can take comfort in knowing that we can communicate our ideas and our intentions without having to make a perfect image of them. The last concept, drawing globally versus drawing locally, highlights one of drawing's most powerful and unique features in that there really is no starting or ending point, which gives us incredible flexibility to take any piece of information at any scale and work inwards towards the details or outwards to flesh out entire ecosystems. Now, we'll stick with maps to help understand this. This is a fantastic map. However, it's incredibly inappropriately scaled if I'm looking for a street address. For that, I have to zoom in to something that is much more detail-oriented, right? On the other hand, if you ask someone on the street to draw you a map of how to get somewhere, nine times out of 10, they start with, we are here, and immediately set a shared concrete reference point. From there, they build out the rest of the map, and they add in information like street names, landmarks, until they finally pinpoint our intended destination. Now, chances are also good that while they are drawing you this map, they're also talking you through it. And there's an interesting thing here that because the visual representation or explanation and the verbal explanation are happening at the same time. Now, I kind of want to jump over and talk about a unique characteristic of language. We can only say one word at a time. So, the order in which I place and deliver those words becomes incredibly important, but it's limited by the structure of the language that I speak. So, if I was going to try to describe the subject of this image to you, <laughs> um, in English, which is, typically follows a pre-nominal descriptive process, I would call it the big red ball. However, if I was going to describe it to you in Spanish, which typically follows a post-nominal descriptive process, I would describe it to you as la bola roja grande, or the ball red big. Now, while these two structures might seem like opposites, they both make total sense, and here's why. In trying to describe the object, both structures place the most absolute and concrete information closest to that target. They also both place more relative and abstract information farther away from that target. So what we see is that even with our words, depending on our language, we zoom in to the thing we're communicating or we zoom out from it. But while language is restricted to the language, or the, the way we speak is restricted to the language that we're using, drawing can use both of these structures interchangeably and often simultaneously. So one more thing that we can learn from mapping is that the most interesting maps are those where each point is enriched by the context of the other points around it. Which means that for every new mark that you make in your drawing and every new piece of information that you add, it's powerful because of its relationship to the other pieces of information around it. Now I want to remind you that these three concepts have nothing to do with your drawing skill. But they have everything to do with framing drawing as a, an accessible and flexible communication tool. If we ask a simple question, why do we draw? What we find is that from veterinarians to sociologists and engineers to agricultural economists, drawing has a place in many different professions. We get responses like this. I draw to help myself understand information. And I draw to save a copy of something. And I draw as a way of seeing and interacting with the world. So responses like this are consistent with the themes that can be mapped onto this matrix of the various modes of drawing where on the vertical axis, we're comparing whether the content of the drawing is more concrete or more abstract. And on the horizontal, we're comparing whether drawing is an internal tool or an external tool. We know that we draw to document what we observe. We draw to communicate that information to others. We draw to internalize and analyze and comprehend new information for ourselves. And we draw to express intangible concepts to other people. If we take all of those modes and mash them together, we get generative drawing which, in addition to highlighting the active nature of drawing, is just a fancy way of saying that drawing helps us think of new connections and synthesize new ideas. 
So I want to summarize with two points. First, drawing activates and, and supplements our visual and cognitive abilities simultaneously, which is analogous to the way that we actually experience visual information in the world around us. This means that drawing is, plays well with the ways that our brains are already hardwired. And it makes drawing a powerful thinking tool in that regard. The second point is that drawing is, in a way, languageless, because it doesn't have to play by the rules or follow the structures of spoken and written language, which means that drawing, with drawing, we can communicate in any direction, in any order, at any scale, making it an incredibly agile communication tool. Just as successful collaboration requires the back and forth exchange of ideas in a process that we call dialogue, I want you to think of drawing as a participatory activity. And just in the way that you speak with each other or write to each other, I'm going to encourage you to go forward today and draw with each other. Because as you've seen, with very little drawing skill and just a few guiding principles, you too can speak with images. Thank you.